Hello Lost Souls, welcome to the channel. A lot of stories for you tonight I have. I know I just spoke like Master Yoda. I do have a special one somewhere within this video as a special request, a story told as a poem. Nope. I am not telling you. You will have to watch the video in full to find out what story it is. Now turn off the lights and make yourself comfortable so we can begin our stories. But before, please help me create more content by giving this video a like. So if you are ready, let's dive into this midnight story video. I grew up in a small sleepy town where everyone knew each other. It was the kind of place where doors were never locked and children played outside until the sun dipped below the horizon. As a kid, I never feared the dark. Shadows were just shadows. The night was just a time to sleep and monsters were just stories. But everything changed when the boogeyman came into my life. I was 10 years old when I first heard about him. It was a cool autumn evening, the kind where the wind whispered secrets through the rustling leaves. My friends and I had gathered around a bonfire, roasting marshmallows and telling ghost stories. That's when Tommy, the oldest and bravest of us all, leaned in and whispered, Have you ever heard about the boogeyman? We shook our heads, our eyes wide with curiosity. Tommy's voice dropped to a conspiratorial whisper. They say he comes for you when you least expect it. He hides under your bed, in your closet, waiting for the perfect moment. And when he gets you, no one ever sees you again. We laughed nervously, brushing off the story as just another one of Tommy's tall tales. But that night, as I lay in bed, I couldn't shake the feeling that someone, or something, was watching me. I pulled the covers up to my chin and squeezed my eyes shut, willing myself to sleep. Weeks passed, and the boogeyman became nothing more than a lingering thought at the back of my mind. That is, until the night I woke up to a faint scratching sound. It was subtle, almost imperceptible, but in the dead of night, it was deafening. My heart pounded as I strained to hear where it was coming from. The closet. Summoning every ounce of courage, I tiptoed to the closet door and slowly opened it. Nothing. I let out a breath I didn't realize I was holding and laughed at my own paranoia. But just as I turned to go back to bed, I saw it. A pair of glowing yellow eyes staring at me from the darkness. I froze, my blood turning to ice. The eyes blinked slowly, almost lazily, as if amused by my terror. Then, a voice, low and guttural, whispered, I've been waiting for you. I slammed the closet door shut and ran to my bed, diving under the covers. I squeezed my eyes shut and whispered to myself, It's just a dream. It's just a dream. But the scratching continued, louder now, more insistent. The next morning I found deep gouges in the closet door, as if something had tried to claw its way out. I told my parents, but they brushed it off as a nightmare. But I knew. I knew the boogeyman was real. One night the scratching was louder than ever. It was under the bed this time. I knew I couldn't ignore it anymore. With trembling hands, I lifted the edge of the blanket and peered into the darkness. The yellow eyes stared back at me closer now. I could see the outline of his grotesque, twisted face. He smiled, revealing sharp, jagged teeth. It's time, he whispered. I screamed, bolting out of bed and racing down the hall to my parents' room. But when I burst through the door, they were gone. The bed was neatly made as if they had never been there. Panic surged through me. I ran through the house calling their names, but there was no answer. The scratching started again, echoing through the empty house. It was louder, more desperate. I knew I had to leave to get away before he caught me. But as I reached the front door, it slammed shut, locking itself with a finality that sent chills down my spine. Trapped, I turned to face the darkness. The boogeyman stepped out of the shadows, his eyes glowing with a predatory gleam. You can't escape, he said, his voice dripping with malice. No one ever does. And then everything went black. 
When I woke up, I was somewhere else. The room was cold and damp, the walls covered in strange ancient symbols. Chains bound my wrists and ankles, holding me in place. The air was thick with the stench of decay. In the corner of the room, the boogeyman watched me, his yellow eyes gleaming with satisfaction. This is just the beginning, he whispered, a cruel smile spreading across his face. Welcome to your new home. The door behind him creaked open, revealing a darkness deeper than any I had ever known. And from that darkness, I heard the sound of footsteps approaching. The boogeyman's smile widened and he stepped aside, allowing the shadows to engulf me. And that's when I realized the true horror had only just begun. As days turned into weeks, the shadows followed me everywhere I went. The sensation of being watched grew stronger, an oppressive weight that pressed down on me even in the brightest daylight. I found myself avoiding mirrors and reflective surfaces, afraid of what I might see lurking just out of sight. My friends noticed the change in me, but I couldn't bring myself to tell them the truth. How could I explain that I was being haunted by shadows and whispers from a story that had become all too real? Sleep became a distant memory. Each night I would lie in bed, eyes wide open, listening to the whispers that now filled my room. They were no longer mere background noise. They spoke to me directly, calling my name, promising terrible things. I could feel their cold breath on my skin, see their dark forms flitting just beyond the edge of my vision. The darkness in my room seemed to pulse with a life of its own, a living entity that grew bolder with each passing night. One evening, in a desperate attempt to escape the relentless torment, I decided to leave the city. I packed a bag and drove out to the countryside, to a small cabin owned by a distant relative. The isolation was supposed to be a reprieve, a chance to clear my mind and escape the shadows. But the moment I stepped inside the cabin, I knew I had made a grave mistake. The air was thick and musty, and the shadows inside seemed darker, more malevolent. As I unpacked, I found an old photograph tucked between the pages of a dusty book. It showed a group of people standing in front of the cabin, their faces obscured by strange, shadowy shapes. In the center of the group was the blind beggar, his milky white eyes staring directly at the camera. I dropped the photo, my hands trembling. How could he be here, in this place, in this old photograph? That night the whispers were louder than ever, echoing through the cabin's wooden walls. I tried to drown them out with music, but they only grew more frenzied, overlapping with the notes to create a nightmarish symphony. The shadows moved closer, pressing in on me from all sides. I could feel their icy touch, their breath on my neck, their fingers brushing against my skin. I curled up on the bed, clutching a knife, my only defense against the unseen horrors. In the dead of night, I woke to the sound of footsteps echoing through the cabin. They were slow, deliberate, coming closer with each passing second. I held my breath, praying they would pass, but they stopped just outside my door. The handle turned slowly and the door creaked open. In the dim light, I saw a figure standing in the doorway, a silhouette of darkness that seemed to absorb all light around it. It was the blind beggar. He stepped into the room, his sightless eyes fixed on me. He raised a hand, and in it, he held the wooden sign, now cracked and worn. Beware the shadows, he rasped, his voice a cold whisper that sent shivers down my spine. The shadows in the room surged forward, enveloping me in their icy embrace. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. I don't know how long I was trapped in that darkness, but when I finally awoke, I was back in my apartment, lying on the floor. The knife was still clutched in my hand, but the whispers were gone, replaced by an eerie silence. I tried to tell myself it was all a nightmare, but the cold handprints on my arm and the deep scratches on my door told a different story. I thought I was free, but the shadows never truly left. They are always there, lurking just out of sight, waiting for the right moment to strike. The whispers have returned, louder and more insistent than before. They speak of terrible things, of darkness and despair, of the coming of something ancient and evil. I fear my time is running out. I can feel the darkness closing in on me, the shadows growing bolder. They taunt me, showing glimpses of what lies beyond the veil of reality, a world of endless night and unspeakable horrors. The blind beggar's warning echoes in my mind, a constant reminder of the doom that awaits me. 
I am trapped, a prisoner of the shadows, with no hope of escape. Every time I close my eyes, I see them, the figures in the darkness, reaching out for me with their cold, clammy hands. I can hear their whispers, promising to take me to a place where the light never shines, where the darkness is eternal. I know I cannot outrun them forever. The shadows will have their due. I write this now as a warning to anyone who hears the tale of the blind beggar. Do not dismiss it as a mere legend, for the shadows are real, and they are hungry. If you see him, if you hear his whispers, do not engage. Turn away, and hope that the darkness does not follow you as it has followed me. As I sit here, the whispers growing louder, I know that my time is nearly up. The shadows are here, filling the room with their cold presence. I can see the blind beggar standing in the corner, his sightless eyes fixed on me, his hand outstretched. The whispers have become a deafening roar, and the darkness is closing in. What will happen when the shadows finally take me? Will I disappear into the night, another lost soul claimed by the darkness? Or will I become one of them, a whisper in the shadows, waiting to claim the next unwary victim? I can feel the cold hands gripping me now, pulling me into the darkness. The last light fades, and the shadows consume me completely. Beware the shadows. Beware the blind beggar. For when the darkness comes for you, there is no escape. I never believed the old stories about the house at the end of Pinewood Drive. Growing up, I thought they were just tales spun to keep us kids out of trouble. But when I inherited the house from my estranged uncle, I discovered the truth was far more terrifying than any ghost story. The first night in the house was eerily silent, the kind of silence that makes you aware of every creak and groan of the old wooden structure. I unpacked my things, trying to make the place feel like home. As I was settling into bed, I heard a faint thud from above. Probably just the house settling, I told myself. The next day, I explored every corner of the house, every corner except the attic. The door to the attic was oddly out of place, with a thick padlock hanging from it. Why would anyone lock an attic in their own house? Curiosity got the better of me, and I rummaged through my uncle's things until I found the key. The door creaked open, releasing a puff of dust into the air. The attic was dark and cluttered with old furniture covered in white sheets. As I stepped inside, the air grew colder, and an unsettling feeling washed over me. In the far corner, I saw an old trunk. It looked out of place, newer than the rest of the items. I approached the trunk, my heart pounding. I knelt and unlatched it, the lid swinging open with a groan. Inside, I found old photographs, yellowed with age. They were of my uncle, but not as I remembered him. He looked younger, happier. There were other faces too, unfamiliar ones, their eyes filled with fear. My breath caught as I noticed the rope burns on their wrists. A cold shiver ran down my spine as I heard a whisper behind me. I turned quickly, but no one was there. The whisper came again, louder this time. Get out! The voice was a raspy, desperate plea. Panic surged through me and I backed away from the trunk, my eyes darting around the room. That's when I saw it. In the far corner, the shadow seemed to twist and move. I blinked, thinking it was my imagination. But then the figure stepped forward. It was a man, his face obscured by shadows, but I could feel his eyes on me piercing and cold. I stumbled back, nearly tripping over the clutter. The figure moved closer, his footsteps echoing in the confined space. I turned and bolted for the door, slamming it shut behind me. My heart pounded in my ears as I fumbled with the padlock, securing it as quickly as I could. I leaned against the door, gasping for breath. The house seemed to close in around me, the silence now deafening. I needed to leave, but as I turned to head downstairs, I heard the attic door creak open again, the padlock clattering to the floor. A chilling voice echoed through the hallway. You can't escape, not now. And then I felt it, a cold hand on my shoulder. I screamed and spun around, but there was no one there. The door to the attic stood wide open, darkness spilling out like an ink blot. My breath came in shallow gasps as I backed away, my eyes never leaving the gaping black maw at the top of the stairs. The hallway seemed to stretch and twist, the shadows growing longer and more menacing. I could hear the whispering again, but now it was coming from all around me, 
a chorus of disembodied voices urging me to leave. But I was frozen, paralyzed by fear. Suddenly the floorboards creaked under the weight of an unseen presence. The air grew colder, and I could see my breath fogging in front of me. A sense of dread washed over me as the whispering grew louder, more insistent. The shadows seemed to pulse and writhe as if alive. Desperate, I ran down the stairs, each step echoing like a gunshot in the silent house. I reached the front door and yanked it open, only to be met with a wall of impenetrable darkness. It was as if the night itself had swallowed the outside world. The whispering followed me, growing louder, more frantic. I slammed the door shut and turned, my back against the solid wood. The house was alive with movement, shadows dancing and flickering at the edges of my vision. The whispering was now a cacophony, a maddening drone that threatened to overwhelm me. Then, out of the darkness, a figure emerged. It was the man from the attic, his face still hidden in shadow, but his eyes glowing with a malevolent light. He reached out a hand, and I felt an icy grip around my throat, choking the life out of me. I struggled, clawing at the air, but his grip only tightened. Just as I thought I would black out, he released me. I fell to the floor, gasping for breath. The figure loomed over me, his eyes burning into mine. You cannot leave, he hissed. You are bound to this place now, just as I am. The realization hit me like a punch to the gut. My uncle had been a prisoner in his own home haunted by this malevolent spirit. And now, I was trapped too. Desperation gave way to determination. I wouldn't let this entity claim me without a fight. I scrambled to my feet and ran to the kitchen, grabbing the first weapon I could find, a rusty old knife. The figure followed, gliding silently across the floor. I swung the knife wildly, but it passed through him like smoke. His laughter was a cold, hollow sound that echoed through the house. You cannot harm me, he said, his voice dripping with malice. I am a part of this place, and now, so are you. I backed away, my mind racing. There had to be a way out, a way to break the hold this spirit had over the house. My eyes fell on the old photographs I had found in the attic. Maybe they held a clue, a way to end this nightmare. With a surge of determination, I ran back up the stairs to the attic, the figure close behind. I grabbed the photographs and searched them frantically, looking for anything that might help. And then I saw it, a symbol carved into the back of one of the photos. It was an intricate design, like nothing I had ever seen before. As I traced the lines with my finger, a strange energy seemed to flow through me. The figure recoiled, his eyes widening in fear. No, he screamed. You cannot use that but I could feel the power in the symbol, a power that seemed to push back against the darkness. I held the photograph up, chanting the words that came to me in a sudden burst of clarity. The figure writhed and twisted, his form dissolving into smoke. The house groaned and shuddered, the walls vibrating with an unearthly energy. The shadows receded, the whispering fading into silence. I felt the grip of the house loosen, the oppressive weight lifting from my shoulders. But as I stood there panting and trembling, I knew it wasn't over. The figure's last words echoed in my mind, a chilling reminder of the danger that still lurked. You cannot escape. Not now. Yeah. And then from the corner of the attic, a pair of glowing eyes opened. I had never believed in the supernatural, but that night tested every ounce of my skepticism. It was a bitterly cold Friday and I was alone in the old, decrepit house my grandparents had left me. The wind outside howled like a mournful spirit, rattling the shutters and making the branches tap against the windows like skeletal fingers. I had settled into the living room, the only light coming from a dim lamp in the flickering television screen. The house was eerily silent, save for the occasional groan of the wooden beams, as if the house itself was alive and restless. I tried to focus on the movie playing, but my attention kept drifting to the strange noises that seemed to be creeping closer. It started with a faint whisper, just barely audible over the sound of the TV. At first I thought it was the wind, but then I heard it again, clearer this time, a voice calling my name. I muted the television and strained to listen, my heart pounding in my chest. The voice was coming from upstairs. I told myself it was just my imagination, but curiosity got the better of me. 
I grabbed a flashlight from the drawer and made my way to the staircase. Each step creaked ominously under my weight, the sound echoing through the empty house. I reached the top of the stairs and paused, listening. The whispering had stopped, replaced by an oppressive silence that seemed to press in from all sides. I moved cautiously down the hallway, my flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. I checked each room, finding nothing out of the ordinary. Finally, I reached the door to the attic. The door was slightly ajar, a thin sliver of light peeking through. I took a deep breath and pushed it open. The attic was filled with old furniture and boxes covered in thick layers of dust. The air was heavy and suffocating, and I could see my breath in the cold. I shone my flashlight around, but there was no sign of anyone. Just as I was about to turn back, I noticed a small, old-fashioned mirror in the corner. Its surface was smeared with grime, but something about it drew me closer. I wiped away the dust with my sleeve and stared into the mirror. For a moment, I saw only my own reflection, pale and wide-eyed. But then, behind me, a shadowy figure began to form. It was a woman, her eyes hollow and her mouth twisted into a silent scream. I spun around, but there was no one there. The hair on the back of my neck stood up as I turned back to the mirror. The woman was still there, her eyes locked onto mine. She raised a hand, pointing towards the far corner of the attic. I followed her gaze and saw an old wooden chest I had never noticed before. My hands trembled as I approached it. The chest was locked, but the key was lying on top, as if it had been waiting for me. I hesitated, every instinct screaming at me to leave it alone, but I couldn't ignore the compulsion to open it. I turned the key and the lid creaked open. Inside I found a collection of old yellowed photographs and a journal bound in cracked leather. I picked up the journal and opened it to the first page. The writing was barely legible, but I could make out a date, 1897. As I began to read, the air grew colder, and I felt a presence behind me. The last thing I read before the flashlight flickered out was a single chilling sentence. She will never let you leave. The darkness enveloped me, a cold, suffocating blanket that seemed to whisper my name from all directions. My flashlight sputtered back to life for a moment, revealing the mirror. In it I saw not just the woman, but countless faces staring back at me, their eyes hollow, their mouths open in eternal, silent screams. And then, everything went dark again. I felt icy fingers close around my wrist, pulling me towards the chest. I struggled, but the grip was unyielding. The journal fell from my hands, landing with a thud that echoed in the stillness. My screams were swallowed by the darkness, and the last thing I heard was the whispering, now a chorus of voices chanting my name, beckoning me to join them. When I was young, my mother told a tale of shadows dark where daylight fails. The boogeyman, she said, lurked near, in corners dark, instilling fear. One stormy night when I was ten, the tale began to feel like sin. Lightning cracked and thunder boomed as shadows danced around my room. A scraping sound, so soft, so slow, from under bed, a dreadful show. I froze in place, my heart aflame and whispered low, it's just a game. Yet louder grew the eerie sound, and dread within me tightly wound. With courage thin, I bent to see what horrors lurked beneath for me. At first, just toys in disarray, but then two eyes like coals they lay. They blinked at me, a crimson hue, and, and terror in my young heart grew. A shadow twisted, body marred, emerging from the dark, it scarred. Its skin a gray, its movements wrong, a nightmare in a tale too long. Against the bed I pressed in fright, its eyes on mine, a horrid sight. It grinned with teeth so sharp and bright and whispered low, now I see light. Its bony hand reached out to me, with claws so sharp, as black as sea. The room grew cold, the warmth it stole, and I tried to scream but lost control. It grabbed my ankle, gripped so tight I found my voice, screamed in the night. The creature paused, its grin so wide. You shouldn't hide, it lowly cried. 
The door burst open, mother's fright. She flicked the switch and brought the light. The boogeyman was gone from sight, yet shadows held a lurking blight. She hugged me close. A dream, she said, but terror thrived within my head. For in the corners, shadows grew. With eyes of red, they watched anew. The light would dim, the night would call, the boogeyman not gone at all. He bides his time in shadows deep, awaiting nights when I can't sleep. I never intended to end up at the old cabin. It was a spur-of-the-moment decision, prompted by a wrong turn, and the sinking realization that my phone had no signal. The sun was setting, casting long shadows through the dense forest, and a sense of unease crept over me. I'd heard stories about this place, whispers of strange noises and eerie lights seen from afar, but I dismissed them as local folklore. The cabin loomed ahead, dark and imposing against the twilight sky. It looked like it had been abandoned for years, its wooden walls weathered and covered in creeping vines. Despite the foreboding atmosphere, I had no choice but to seek shelter. The air had grown colder, and the forest around me was filled with unsettling sounds. Branches snapped underfoot, and every rustle of leaves seemed magnified in the encroaching darkness. I pushed open the creaking door and stepped inside. The air was thick with dust and decay, the remnants of a life long forgotten. Cobwebs hung from the ceiling like ghostly veils, and the floorboards groaned under my weight. I found a tattered old armchair and sank into it, trying to shake off the feeling that I was being watched. The silence was deafening, broken only by the occasional drip of water from a leaky roof. I fumbled for my flashlight, its weak beam casting eerie shadows on the walls. As I scanned the room, my light fell on an old photograph hanging crookedly on the wall. It showed a family, their faces blurred with age, standing in front of this very cabin. Their eyes seemed to follow me, filled with a haunting emptiness. A sudden chill ran down my spine as a faint whisper echoed through the room. I froze, straining to listen, but all I could hear was the pounding of my own heart. The whisper came again, louder this time, like a breathy voice speaking in a language I couldn't understand. Panic set in, and I bolted upright, the flashlight slipping from my grasp and plunging the room into darkness. In the pitch black silence, my senses were heightened. Every creak of the cabin, every sigh of the wind seemed amplified. I felt a presence, something unseen but undeniably there, lurking in the shadows. I fumbled for the flashlight, my hand shaking, and when I finally managed to switch it back on, the beam revealed something that made my blood run cold. Standing in the corner, half hidden by the darkness, was a figure. Its eyes glowed with a malevolent light, and a twisted smile spread across its face. I couldn't move, couldn't scream, as it slowly started towards me, each step deliberate and menacing. The last thing I saw before the flashlight flickered and died was its outstretched hand reaching for me. I awoke with a start, gasping for air. My body a chid, and for a moment I wasn't sure where I was. Then the memories fluted back, and I realized I was still in the cabin. The figure was gone, but the fear lingered, wrapping around me like a shroud. I had to get out of there, but the night was still deep, and the forest outside seemed even more threatening. Summoning my courage, I lit a candle I found on a dusty shelf. The flickering flame cast an eerie glow, revealing more of the cabin's dilapidated interior. The whispers started again, this time more insistent, and I felt a cold breath on the back of my neck. I spun around, but there was nothing there, just the oppressive darkness pressing in from all sides. I decided to search the cabin, hoping to find something that could explain the strange occurrences. As I moved through the rooms, I discovered signs of a hurried departure. Clothes left behind, dishes still on the table as if the occupants had fled suddenly. The air grew heavier with each step, and I felt the weight of unseen eyes watching my every move. In the back room, I found a journal lying open on a small desk. Its pages were yellowed with age, the ink faded but still legible. The entries were filled with frantic scribbles, recounting terrifying experiences that mirrored my own. The final entry sent a chill through my veins. They come at night. There is no escape. The writing trailed off into an illegible scrawl, as if the author had been interrupted. 
Suddenly, a loud bang echoed through the cabin, followed by the sound of footsteps. My heart raced as I peered into the hallway, my candle flickering wildly. The shadow seemed to shift and move, and I caught glimpses of ghostly figures out of the corner of my eye. Panic gripped me as the footsteps grew closer, heavy and deliberate, like the slow march of death. I backed into a corner, clutching the journal to my chest like a talisman. The footsteps stopped just outside the door, and I could feel the presence on the other side. A low growl resonated through the wood, vibrating through my bones. My mind raced, trying to think of a way out, but all I could do was wait, paralyzed by fear. The door creaked open, and a cold draft swept into the room, extinguishing my candle. In the darkness, I could see glowing eyes staring at me, filled with a malevolent hunger. The figure from before stepped into the room, its twisted smile even more grotesque in the dim light. It raised a hand, and I felt a force pulling me towards it, an irresistible compulsion that sapped my will to resist. Just as I thought I was lost, a blinding light filled the room, and the figure recoiled with a hiss. The light grew brighter, and I felt the force release its grip on me. I turned to see a figure standing in the doorway, bathed in a brilliant glow. Leave this place, the figure said, its voice echoing with power. You do not belong here. The figure's light continued to illuminate the room, pushing back the darkness and revealing more details of the cabin's eerie interior. The malevolent presence retreated, its eyes still glowing with hatred, but unable to withstand the brilliance of the newcomer. I felt a surge of hope, mingled with confusion and fear. Who was this guardian, and why had they come to my aid? The glowing figure turned to me, its face obscured by the radiance. You must leave now, it repeated, its voice calm but urgent. This place is not safe. The spirits here are restless, and they will not stop until they have claimed another soul. The gravity of the situation sank in, and I nodded, my mind racing with questions that would have to wait. With the Guardian leading the way, we made our way out of the cabin. The air outside was cold and still, the forest eerily silent. As we walked, the light from the Guardian seemed to create a protective bubble around us, warding off the encroaching darkness. I glanced back at the cabin, its windows now dark and empty, and a shiver ran through me. Whatever had happened there, it was far from over. We reached the edge of the forest and the Guardian stopped, its light beginning to fade. This is as far as I can go, it said, its voice tinged with sadness. You are safe now, but you must never return to this place. I wanted to ask so many questions, but the Guardian was already beginning to fade, its form dissolving into the night. Remember, it whispered, the spirits are always watching. I found myself alone again, but the sense of fear and dread had lifted slightly. I hurried along the path, eager to put as much distance as possible between myself and the cabin. As I walked, the memories of the night replayed in my mind, each detail etched with terrifying clarity. The Guardian had saved me, but the question of what had drawn me to that place, and what had happened to its previous inhabitants, lingered. Days turned into weeks, and the experience at the cabin began to feel like a distant nightmare. I returned to my daily routine, but the memory of that night never truly faded. I often found myself glancing over my shoulder, the feeling of being watched never entirely leaving me. I knew the spirits were out there, waiting, biding their time. One evening as I was preparing for bed, I noticed something strange. The photograph I had seen in the cabin was now lying on my nightstand. My heart pounded as I picked it up, recognizing the ghostly faces staring back at me. How had it gotten here? A cold realization washed over me. The spirits had found me, and they were not done with me yet. I tried to dismiss the photograph as a trick of my mind, but deep down, I knew the truth. The spirits had marked me, and their malevolent influence was spreading. Shadows seemed to move in the corners of my vision, and whispers filled the night air. Sleep became elusive, as nightmares plagued my dreams, dragging me back to the cabin again and again. Desperate for answers, I began researching the history of the cabin. 
I discovered it had once been the home of a reclusive family rumored to be involved in dark rituals and forbidden practices. The family had disappeared without a trace, and the cabin had been abandoned ever since. The locals spoke of cursed grounds and restless spirits, warning all who would listen to stay far away. And driven by a need to understand what was happening to me, I decided to return to the cabin. It was a risk, but I had to uncover the truth. Armed with the journal and a newfound determination, I made my way back to the forest. The path seemed longer and more treacherous than before, the trees closing in around me as if trying to keep me out. When I finally reached the cabin, it looked even more foreboding in the daylight. The windows were still dark, and the air was thick with an oppressive silence. I hesitated at the door, the memories of that night rushing back in vivid detail. But I had come too far to turn back now. Taking a deep breath, I stepped inside. The interior was just as I remembered, a snapshot of decay and abandonment. I moved quickly, guided by a sense of urgency, and began searching for anything that could provide answers. As I sifted through the remnants of the family's life, I found more clues, scraps of paper with strange symbols, a locked box hidden under a loose floorboard, and an old map marked with cryptic notations. The journal proved invaluable. Its entries detailed the family's descent into madness, their obsession with contacting the spirit world. They had performed rituals, opened doors that should have remained closed, and in doing so, they had unleashed something they couldn't control. The final pages spoke of a summoning gone wrong, a malevolent entity that had taken hold of the cabin and refused to let go. I felt a chill as I read the last entry, the words almost seeming to crawl off the page. We are cursed. The spirits will not rest. They will take whoever enters this place. God forgive us. The weight of their desperation was palpable, and I knew then that the cabin was a prison, its walls holding the tormented souls of those who had dabbled in dark forces. A sudden noise shattered the silence, and I spun around to see the figure standing in the doorway once more. Its eyes burned with a cold fire, and its smile was a twisted mockery of life. The journal slipped from my hands as I backed away, my heart pounding in my chest. The figure advanced, its presence suffocating, and I realized with a sinking dread that I might not escape this time. In a desperate bid for survival, I grabbed the locked box and ran. The figure followed, its footsteps echoing through the cabin like the tolling of a death knell. I burst through the door and into the forest, the trees closing in around me as if trying to swallow me whole. I didn't stop until I reached the edge of the woods, my lungs burning and my legs shaking. The box felt heavy in my hands, a tangible reminder of the horrors I had witnessed. As I looked back at the dark line of trees, I knew I couldn't rest until I understood the full extent of the curse. The spirits were still watching, and the only way to break their hold was to confront them head on. Back at my home, I examined the box closely. Its surface was covered in intricate carvings, symbols that matched those I had seen in the journal. I felt a strange energy emanating from it, a pulsating rhythm that seemed to sync with my heartbeat. I knew I had to open it, but the lock was ancient and unyielding. I searched for a key, scouring the cabin's blueprints and the journal for clues. Eventually, I found a hidden compartment in the journal, containing a small rusted key. My hands trembled as I inserted it into the lock, the click echoing through the room like a gunshot. Inside the box, I found a collection of ritualistic items, candles, bones, and a small obsidian knife. There was also a piece of parchment, covered in more of the strange symbols, and a detailed set of instructions. The ritual was a binding ceremony, meant to trap the malevolent spirits and close the doors they had opened. It was dangerous, the parchment warned requiring absolute precision and unwavering resolve. But it was my only chance to end the nightmare. I gathered the necessary items, my heart heavy with the weight of what I was about to undertake. The night was moonless, the darkness almost tangible as I returned to the cabin. I set up the ritual space in the main room, following the instructions to the letter. The air was thick with anticipation, and the forest seemed to hold its breath, watching and waiting. As I lit the candles and arranged the bones, I felt the presence of the spirits closing in, their whispers growing louder and more insistent. 
With the obsidian knife, I pricked my finger and let a drop of blood fall onto the parchment. The symbols began to glow with an eerie light, and a cold wind swept through the cabin, extinguishing the candles. I recited the incantation, my voice shaking but determined. The room seemed to pulse with a dark energy, and the walls vibrated as if the cabin itself was alive. The figure appeared again, its eyes blazing with fury. It lunged at me, but an invisible barrier held it back. I continued the incantation, the words flowing through me like a river of power. The spirits screamed, their cries of anguish filling the air, but I didn't falter. The ritual was working, the symbols burning brighter with each word. As I reached the final verse, a blinding light filled the cabin, and the spirits shrieked in agony. The figure dissolved into the air, its malevolent presence evaporating like mist. The walls of the cabin groaned and creaked, the oppressive darkness lifting. I felt a sense of release, as if a great weight had been lifted from my soul. When the light faded, I found myself standing in the silent cabin, the ritual items scattered around me. The air was still and peaceful, the malevolent energy gone. I knew the spirits had been bound, their curse broken at last. I gathered my things and left the cabin, the forest parting before me like a welcoming embrace. The drive home was a blur, my mind reeling from the events of the night. I had faced the darkness and emerged victorious, but the experience had left its mark. I was no longer the same person who had stumbled upon the cabin by chance. The memories of the spirits and their tormented cries haunted me, a reminder of the thin veil between our world and the next. In the days that followed, I tried to return to normal life, but the shadows lingered. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, and strange occurrences continued to plague me. Objects moved on their own, whispers filled the air, and the photograph of the family appeared in different places around my house. The spirits were gone, but their influence remained, a residual echo of their torment. Now, determined to rid myself of the last remnants of the curse, I sought the help of a paranormal expert. Dr. Eliza Morton was a renowned researcher in the field of the supernatural. Her work respected and feared in equal measure. I reached out to her, recounting my experiences and begging for her assistance. She agreed to meet with me, intrigued by the details of my story. Dr. Morton arrived at my home, her presence commanding and authoritative. She examined the photograph in the journal, her eyes narrowing as she read the final entries. The spirits are bound, but their energy lingers, she explained. We must perform a cleansing ritual to banish their influence completely. I nodded, willing to do whatever it took to finally be free. Together we prepared for the ritual gathering herbs, candles, and other necessary items. The process was intricate and required precise timing, but Dr. Morton's expertise guided us through each step. As we worked, she explained the importance of intent and focus, the power of the mind in overcoming supernatural forces. Her words gave me strength, and I felt a renewed sense of determination. The night of the cleansing ritual was clear and still, the stars shining brightly overhead. We set up the ritual space in my living room, the air filled with the scent of burning sage. Dr. Morton led the ceremony, her voice strong and steady as she chanted the incantations. I followed her lead, my own voice adding to the chorus of power. As the ritual progressed, the atmosphere in the room changed. The air grew heavy, and a cold breeze swept through the house. The photograph and other cursed items began to glow with a soft light, and I felt the presence of the spirits once more. But this time they were not malevolent. They were pleading, seeking release from their eternal torment. Dr. Morton instructed me to focus on the light, to visualize the spirits being lifted and freed. I closed my eyes, channeling all my energy into the ritual. The light grew brighter, enveloping the room in a warm glow. The whispers grew softer, turning into sighs of relief as the spirits were finally released from their bondage. When the ritual ended, the room was filled with a profound sense of peace. The photograph lay on the floor, its image now clear and serene. The faces of the family no longer looked tormented, their eyes free from the haunting emptiness that had plagued them. I felt a weight lift from my shoulders, and for the first time since that fateful night, I truly felt free. With the spirits finally at rest, I was able to rebuild my life. The nightmares ceased, 
and the strange occurrences stopped. I took down the photograph and stored it away, a reminder of the ordeal I had overcome. The cabin and its horrors became a distant memory, a story to tell on dark nights, but no longer a living nightmare. I continued to correspond with Dr. Morton, her guidance and support invaluable in helping me move forward. She encouraged me to document my experiences, to share my story with others who might be facing similar challenges. I took her advice, writing down every detail of my encounter with the spirits and the rituals that had freed them. As the months passed, I found a new sense of purpose. I began to research the supernatural, driven by a desire to understand the forces that had nearly claimed my soul. I reached out to others who had experienced hauntings, offering my support and sharing what I had learned. My journey had changed me, but it had also given me the strength to help others facing their own battles with the unknown. One evening, as I was going through my notes, I received a call from Dr. Morton. I found something you need to see, she said, her voice filled with urgency. She explained that she had uncovered more information about the family who had lived in the cabin, details that could shed light on the true nature of the curse. I agreed to meet her, my curiosity peaked, and my sense of unease returning. We met at a local library, surrounded by dusty tomes and ancient manuscripts. Dr. Morton laid out her findings, revealing a hidden history of the family's involvement in dark rituals and forbidden practices. They had sought power and knowledge, but their ambition had led them to open doors that should have remained closed. The curse had been their doing, a consequence of their own actions, and the spirits had been victims of their greed. As we delved deeper into the family's past, we discovered a possible connection to other hauntings and cursed locations. It seemed the family's influence had spread far beyond the cabin, their dark legacy leaving a trail of torment and suffering. Dr. Morton and I realized that our work was far from over. There were still others who needed help, other spirits in need of release. With our newfound knowledge, Dr. Morton and I dedicated ourselves to unraveling the mysteries of the supernatural. We traveled to various haunted locations, performing rituals, and helping those plagued by malevolent spirits. Each encounter was different, but the underlying themes were always the same. Human ambition, forbidden knowledge, and the thin veil between our world and the next. Our work brought us closer together, forming a bond forged in the fires of our shared experiences. We faced dangers and challenges, but each victory strengthened our resolve. The spirits we encountered were not always malevolent. Some were lost, seeking peace and closure. We gave them the release they craved, bringing light to the darkest corners of the world. One night, as we prepared for another ritual, Dr. Morton shared her thoughts with me. Our journey began with that cabin, she said, her voice thoughtful. But it has become so much more. We are guardians now, protectors of the living and the dead. Our work will never truly end, but each spirit we free brings us closer to understanding the true nature of the supernatural. Her words resonated with me, and I realized the truth of our mission. The cabin had been the beginning, a catalyst that set us on a path we could never have imagined. The spirits we encountered were reminders of the delicate balance between our world and the next, a balance we were now sworn to protect. As the years passed, our reputation grew, and we became known as experts in the field of the supernatural. People sought us out, desperate for answers and relief from their own hauntings. We faced new challenges, each more daunting than the last, but we never wavered. The spirits were always watching, and we were always ready. One evening, after a particularly harrowing ritual, I found myself reflecting on my journey. The fear and uncertainty that had once plagued me were gone, replaced by a sense of purpose and strength. The cabin and its curse had been a trial by fire, but it had also forged me into who I was now, a guardian, a protector, and a beacon of hope for those lost in the darkness. The night was quiet, the stars shining brightly overhead. As I stood on the porch, I felt a presence beside me. Dr. Morton joined me, her eyes filled with the same determination that had guided us from the beginning. We've come a long way, she said, her voice steady, but our journey is far from over. I nodded, knowing she was right. The spirits would always be there, watching and waiting. But so would we, ever vigilant, ready to face the darkness and bring light to those who needed it most. 
The unending vigil was our calling, and we would continue to honor it no matter what challenges lay ahead. And so our story continued, a never-ending tale of courage, resilience, and the unyielding fight against the forces of darkness. For as long as the spirits watched, we would stand guard, unwavering and resolute, bringing hope to the haunted and peace to the tormented. The night was our ally, and the light was our guide, leading us ever onward into the unknown. I'll never forget the moment I stepped into the lobby of the Cecil Hotel. The air felt heavy, weighed down by a thousand untold stories. The desk clerk was an older man with a gaunt face and eyes that seemed to look through you rather than at you. His voice was a gravelly whisper when he asked for my name. John Reynolds, I said, trying to ignore the creeping sensation running up my spine. The lobby, dimly lit and musty, seemed frozen in time. The wallpaper was peeling, and the furniture looked as though it hadn't been replaced in decades. The place reeked of neglect and something far more sinister. As I took my key, the clerk leaned in closer than necessary. Room 1408, he said, his breath foul. Be careful, Mr. Reynolds. Some rooms in this hotel have a history. He grinned, showing yellowed teeth, and handed me an old-fashioned brass key. The elevator creaked and groaned as it ascended to the 14th floor. Each floor we passed seemed to bring an added weight to my chest. When the doors finally opened with a ding, I stepped into a hallway that felt impossibly long, stretching into the shadows. The hall was eerily silent, and the light fixtures flickered sporadically, casting long, unsettling shadows. As I walked, I could hear my own footsteps echoing back at me. The numbers on the doors passed by slowly. 1402, 1404, 1406 until I stood in front of room 1408. My hand shook slightly as I inserted the key into the lock. The room was disappointingly normal at first glance, with a bed, a nightstand, and a small desk. But there was something off. The air felt colder, and I could hear a faint humming sound, like a distant chant. I shook my head, trying to dismiss the irrational fears creeping in. I set my suitcase down and began to unpack, but the unease wouldn't leave me. It felt as if the room was watching me, studying me. The windows were grimy, offering a view of the city below, cloaked in night. I tried to push the feeling aside and focused on settling in. Little did I know, this was just the beginning of a night I would never forget. As the night wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I sat on the edge of the bed, flipping through the channels on the old television, but nothing could hold my attention. The humming sound grew louder, more insistent. It seemed to be coming from the walls themselves. I approached the wall where the sound was most intense and pressed my ear against it. The humming was clearer now, almost like whispering voices just beyond the plaster. I jumped back, my heart pounding. This couldn't be real. I had to be imagining it. I decided to take a shower, hoping the steam and heat would clear my heat. The bathroom was just as dadded as the rest of the hotel with cracked tiles and a stained tub. As the whiter warm it up, I step it in, letting it wash over me. For a moment I began to relax, but then the light above the mirror flickered and went out. I stood there in the dark, the only light coming from the thin sliver of the bathroom door. The humming was back, louder and more urgent. I could hear it clearly now, a chorus of voices whispering words I couldn't understand. My heart raced and I felt a chill that the hot water couldn't chase away. Suddenly the shower curtain fluttered, as if someone had brushed against it. I turned quickly, my hand gripping the curtain. But there was nothing there. Just my mind playing tricks on me, I told myself. I quickly rinsed off and stepped out of the shower, my nerves on edge. When I looked in the mirror, my reflection seemed distorted, almost sinister. The steam on the glass blurred my features but there was something in my eyes that didn't belong to me. I wiped the mirror with my hand, trying to see clearly, but the humming persisted, filling the room with its eerie melody. I dressed quickly and left the bathroom, feeling more vulnerable than ever. As I sat on the bed, the whispers grew louder, filling my head. I covered my ears, but it was no use. The voices were inside me now, their words a jumbled mess of fear and dread. This was no ordinary hotel room. 
this place was alive with something dark, something evil. I tried to sleep, but the whispers wouldn't let me. They were relentless, a constant barrage of unintelligible words that gnawed at my sanity. I tossed and turned, my mind racing. What was happening here? What was the source of these voices? I needed answers, but more than that, I needed to escape. At some point, exhaustion overcame me, and I drifted into a restless sleep. My dreams were chaotic, filled with shadowy figures and unsettling images. I dreamed of the hotel, its hallways twisting and turning, leading me deeper into darkness. The whispers followed me even in sleep, their cadence haunting and unending. I woke with a start, my heart pounding in my chest. The room was dark, the only light coming from the neon sign outside my window, casting an eerie red glow. I glanced at the clock. It was 3.15 a.m., the witching hour. A shiver ran down my spine. As I sat up in bed, I heard a soft knock at the door. My breath caught in my throat. Who would be knocking at this hour? I hesitated, my mind racing with possibilities. Maybe it was another guest in need of help. Maybe it was the clerk with some important information. Or maybe it was something far more sinister. The knock came again, more insistent this time. I got out of bed and approached the door, my heart hammering in my chest. Who's there? I called out, trying to keep my voice steady. There was no answer, just the persistent knocking. I took a deep breath and opened the door. The hallway was empty. There was no one there. I stepped out, looking left and right, but the corridor stretched on, deserted and silent. A chill settled over me as I closed the door and locked it securely. I returned to the bed, my mind a whirlwind of fear and confusion. As I lay down, I noticed something on the nightstand that hadn't been there before. A small, folded piece of paper. With trembling hands, I picked it up and unfolded it. The message was scrawled in a shaky hand, the letters uneven and frantic. It read, Get out. Now. The note was all the confirmation I needed that something was terribly wrong in the Cecil Hotel. My hands shook as I held the paper, the urgency of the message piercing through my fear. I had to leave, and I had to leave now. I grabbed my suitcase and began to hastily pack my things. The room seemed to close in around me, the whispers growing louder, more desperate. It felt as if the walls themselves were alive, breathing, watching. My movements became frantic as I struggled to zip up my suitcase. Just as I was about to head for the door, the room went completely dark. The humming ceased, replaced by an oppressive silence. My breath hitched, and I stood frozen, straining to see anything in the pitch-black room. Then I felt it, a cold, clammy hand on my shoulder. I spun around, but there was nothing there. My heart raced, and I fumbled for the light switch. When the lights flickered back on, the room was empty, but the sense of being watched was stronger than ever. I had to get out of this room, out of this hotel. I reached for the door handle, but it wouldn't budge. It was as if an unseen force was holding it shut. Panic surged through me, and I pulled harder, but the door remained stubbornly closed. I banged on it, shouting for help, but my voice seemed to be swallowed by the walls. The whispers returned, louder and more insistent. They seemed to mock me, taunt me. The temperature in the room dropped, and I could see my breath in the air. The sensation of cold hands gripping my shoulders returned, more forceful this time, pushing me back from the door. Desperation took over, and I started looking for another way out. The window was my only option. I rushed to it, struggling to open the stubborn frame. The city lights outside seemed distant, unreachable. I finally managed to open the window, but when I looked down, the drop was dizzying. As I stood there contemplating my next move, the whispers reached a crescendo. They filled my head, my very being, with an overwhelming sense of dread. I had no choice. I had to jump. But just as I was about to climb out, a voice, clear and distinct, cut through the chaos. Don't do it, John. The voice that called my name was unlike the others. It was calm, authoritative, and familiar. I turned away from the window, searching for the source. Standing in the middle of the room was a figure, cloaked in shadows. My heart pounded as I tried to make out their features. Who are you? I demanded, my voice shaking. 
The figure stepped forward, and the light revealed a middle-aged woman with kind eyes and an air of sorrow about her. She seemed out of place in this nightmare. My name is Elizabeth, she said softly. I used to live here many years ago. Her voice was filled with a sadness that tugged at my heart. This place, it changes you. It feeds on your fears, your pain. I stared at her, trying to process what she was saying. What do you mean? What's happening to me? Elizabeth sighed and looked around the room, her expression one of deep regret. The Cecil Hotel is a place of darkness. It has a history of death and despair. Those who stay here too long, they become part of it. Her words sent a chill down my spine. What do you mean, part of it? The spirits of those who died here are trapped, unable to move on. They're bound to this place, feeding off the living who come here. The hotel uses their pain to draw in more victims. She looked at me with pity. You need to leave before it's too late. I nodded, the urgency of her words spurring me into action. I tried. The door won't open. Something is keeping me here. Elizabeth nodded knowingly. It won't let you go easily. You need to face it, confront your fears. Only then will you be free. I felt a surge of determination. How do I do that? She stepped closer, her presence a strange comfort in the midst of my terror. You need to go to the basement. That's where it all began. The source of the darkness is there. Confront it, and you might have a chance. The thought of descending into the bowels of this cursed hotel filled me with dread, but I knew I had no other choice. I nodded, steeling myself for what was to come. Thank you, Elizabeth. She smiled sadly. Be careful, John. The hotel won't let you go without a fight. With that, she faded away, leaving me alone once more. I gathered my courage and left the room, stepping into the hallway with a renewed sense of purpose. The whispers were still there, but they seemed more distant now, less threatening. I followed the signs to the staircase, knowing the elevator was too risky. Each step I took echoed in the silence, the sound bouncing off the walls. The further down I went, the colder it became. By the time I reached the basement, the air was frigid, and the darkness seemed to press in on me from all sides. The basement was a labyrinth of corridors and storage rooms, all filled with the detritus of the hotel's long history. The flickering fluorescent lights cast eerie shadows, and I could hear the faint humming again, like a distant chant. I wandered through the maze, my flashlight cutting through the gloom. The sense of being watched was stronger than ever, and I could feel the presence of the spirits around me. Their whispers grew louder, more urgent, as if they were trying to warn me. Finally, I reached a large, rusted door at the end of a long corridor. This was it, the source of the darkness. I took a deep breath and pushed the door open, stepping into a room that felt like a different world altogether. The air was thick with a foul odor, and the walls were covered in strange, pulsating growths. In the center of the room was an old, decrepit altar, surrounded by dark stains that could only be blood. The chanting was loud here, almost deafening. As I approached the altar, I felt a force pushing back against me, trying to keep me away. I fought against it, my determination growing stronger. I reached the altar and placed my hand on it, feeling the cold stone beneath my fingers. The chanting stopped abruptly and the room fell silent. The darkness seemed to recede and I felt a sense of release, as if a great weight had been lifted. The whispers faded, replaced by a profound silence. I turned to leave, but the door slammed shut behind me. I was trapped. Panic set in, but I forced myself to stay calm. I had faced the darkness, confronted my fears. Now I just had to find a way out. As I stood there trapped in the basement of the Cecil Hotel, I felt a presence behind me. I turned slowly, my flashlight trembling in my hand. There, in the shadows, stood a figure cloaked in darkness. Its eyes glowed with a malevolent light, and its form seemed to shift and waver as if it were made of smoke. You cannot escape, the figure hissed, its voice a chilling whisper that sent shivers down my spine. You belong to us now. I took a step back, my heart pounding in my chest. Who are you? The figure laughed, a sound that echoed through the room like the tolling of a death knell. 
I am the keeper of this place, the collector of souls, and you, John, are my latest prize. I felt a surge of anger and defiance. No, I won't let you take me. The figure moved closer, its form growing more solid, more menacing. You have no choice. The hotel has claimed you. Your fears, your pain, they feed us. You cannot escape. I took another step back, my mind racing. I had to find a way to fight back, to break free. I remembered Elizabeth's words. I needed to confront my fears. I took a deep breath and faced the figure, my resolve hardening. I'm not afraid of you, I said, my voice steady despite the terror that gripped me. You have no power over me. The figure recoiled, its form flickering. Lies. You are weak. You are nothing. I stepped forward, my confidence growing. No, I'm not. I'm stronger than you think. I will not let you take me. The figure shrieked, its form dissolving into a swirling mass of darkness. The room shook, and the temperature dropped even further. I stood my ground, refusing to back down. The darkness swirled around me, and I could feel the cold fingers of fear trying to take hold. But I fought back, drawing on every ounce of strength I had. I am not afraid, I repeated, my voice ringing out in the silence. The darkness recoiled and the figure screamed, a sound of pure rage and frustration. The room began to brighten, the oppressive weight lifting. I could see the door again, and I knew I had won. The figure dissolved into nothingness and the whispers faded away. The room was silent, the air clear. I took a deep breath and walked to the door, opening it and stepping back into the corridor. I had faced the darkness and emerged victorious. The hotel seemed different as I made my way back to the lobby. The oppressive atmosphere had lifted and the whispers were gone. The halls were still dimly lit and worn, but the sense of malevolence had dissipated. I reached the lobby and found the old desk clerk waiting for me. His expression was unreadable, but there was a hint of something in his eyes. Respect, perhaps, or relief. You made it, he said simply. I nodded, feeling a wave of exhaustion wash over me. I did. The hotel. It's free now, isn't it? The clerk nodded. You faced the darkness and conquered it. The spirits trapped here can move on, and the hotel's curse is lifted. You did a great thing, Mr. Reynolds. I felt a surge of pride and relief. I had faced my fears and emerged victorious. Thank you, I said, feeling a weight lift from my shoulders. I think it's time for me to go. The clerk smiled faintly. Indeed. Go, and may you find peace. He handed me a new key, one that would open the front door. I took the key and made my way outside, the cool night air refreshing against my skin. The city was still cloaked in darkness, but it felt different now, less threatening. I walked away from the Cecil Hotel, feeling a sense of freedom I hadn't felt in years. As I left the hotel behind, I thought about the people who had been trapped there, their pain and suffering feeding the darkness. They were free now, and so was I. I had faced my fears, confronted the darkness, and emerged victorious. I walked through the city, the first light of dawn breaking on the horizon. A new day was beginning, and with it, a new chapter of my life. I had survived a night at the Cecil Hotel, and in doing so, I had found a strength within myself I never knew existed. And so, I walked on, leaving the past behind and stepping into the light of a new day, free at last from the shadows of the Cecil Hotel. The clock on my dashboard blinked 11.47 p.m. as I drove along the lonely highway. The road was pitch black, save for the faint glow of my headlights cutting through the dense fog. The radio had long given up on finding a station, leaving me with nothing but the hum of the engine and my own thoughts. The darkness seemed to have a life of its own, pressing in on the car like a tangible entity. I'd been on the road for hours, the empty stretch of asphalt never seeming to end. There was something unsettling about the silence, an oppressive weight that made my skin crawl. Every shadow cast by my headlights seemed to shift and move just out of sight, but I told myself it was just my tired mind playing tricks on me. Out of nowhere, I spotted a figure in the distance. At first, I thought it was just another shadow, but as I got closer, I realized it was a man, 
standing by the side of the road, his thumb outstretched in a gesture of desperation. Against my better judgment, I pulled over. After all, who else would be out here at this hour? He approached the car slowly, and as he got closer, I noticed his clothes were tattered, and his face was gaunt, almost skeletal. His eyes were wide and hollow, reflecting the light of my headlights in a way that made them seem almost otherworldly. He leaned down to the window, his voice barely more than a whisper. Thank you. I've been walking for hours. Can you give me a ride? Something in his voice sent a shiver down my spine, but I couldn't leave him out here. I unlocked the door and he slipped into the passenger seat. As soon as he closed the door, the temperature in the car seemed to drop and a faint smell of decay filled the air. I glanced over at him, but he was staring straight ahead, silent. We drove in silence for what felt like an eternity. Every now and then I would sneak a glance at him, but he never moved, never spoke. The only sound was the rhythmic thump of the tires on the road. I tried to shake off the growing sense of dread, but it clung to me like a shadow. As the miles ticked by, I noticed the landscape around us changing. The trees lining the road seemed to twist and contort, their branches reaching out like skeletal fingers. The fog grew thicker, wrapping around the car like a shroud. The road ahead appeared to stretch on forever, with no sign of civilization in sight. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the man finally turn to look at me. His eyes were dark, almost black, and his mouth twisted into a grin that sent a jolt of fear through me. Thank you for picking me up, he said, his voice no longer a whisper but a chilling, echoing rasp. Not many people would stop for a dead man. Then my heart pounded in my chest as I gripped the steering wheel, knuckles white. What do you mean? I managed to stammer. He leaned closer, and the smell of decay grew stronger. I died on this road years ago. You were kind enough to stop for me. Now I can finally take someone with me. I slammed on the brakes, but the car didn't stop. It kept moving, as if possessed by some unseen force. The man started to laugh, a low, guttural sound that filled the car and echoed in my mind. The road ahead seemed to stretch into eternity, the fog closing in around us. Panic surged through me as I frantically tried to regain control of the car. The man beside me seemed to grow darker, his form shifting and blurring as if he were made of shadows. His laughter grew louder, more manic, echoing in my ears until I thought I would go mad. I glanced in the rearview mirror, hoping to see some sign of life, but all I saw was darkness. The fog outside the windows was so thick that it was like driving through a void. My headlights barely penetrated the gloom, casting eerie, distorted shadows that seemed to dance and writhe with malevolent intent. Suddenly the man's laughter stopped, replaced by a chilling silence. I turned to look at him, but he was gone. The passenger seat was empty, the door wide open. The temperature in the car returned to normal, and the smell of decay faded. I was alone. Relief washed over me, but it was short-lived. The car began to slow on its own, despite my foot pressing harder on the accelerator. The headlights dimmed, and the engine sputtered as if it were dying. I pulled over to the side of the road, heart racing, and stepped out into the cold, damp air. As I stood there, the fog began to lift, revealing a landscape that was both familiar and horrifying. The trees around me were twisted and gnarled, their branches reaching out like skeletal hands. The ground was littered with old, rusted cars, their occupants long gone. It was a graveyard of forgotten souls, trapped in a place where time had no meaning. I turned back to the car and my blood ran cold. The man was standing behind me, his eyes glowing with an eerie light. His grin was wider now, his teeth sharp and jagged. Welcome to your new home, he said, his voice echoing in the stillness. You will join the others soon. Desperation took hold of me and I ran. I ran through the twisted forest, branches tearing at my clothes and skin, the man's laughter echoing in my ears. No matter how fast I ran, the landscape never changed. It was as if I were trapped in a nightmare, unable to escape. Finally, I stumbled into a clearing, gasping for breath. The fog was thicker here, swirling around me like a living thing. In the center of the clearing stood a house, old and decrepit, its windows dark and lifeless. Drawn by some unseen force, I approached the house, my heart pounding in my chest. The door creaked open as I reached it, 
revealing a dark interior. I hesitated, fear gripping me, but I couldn't turn back. I stepped inside, and the door slammed shut behind me. The air was thick with dust and the smell of decay, and I could barely see in the dim light. As I moved deeper into the house, I heard faint whispers like the voices of the dead. They called to me, beckoning me to join them. I followed the sound, drawn to a staircase that led down into the darkness. The steps creaked under my weight, each one a reminder of the inescapable fate that awaited me. At the bottom of the stairs, I found myself in a basement, the walls lined with old photographs and faded newspaper clippings. They told the stories of countless others who had disappeared on this road, their faces staring back at me with hollow eyes. In the center of the room was a mirror, its surface covered in a thick layer of dust. I wiped the dust away, revealing my reflection. But it wasn't just me. Behind me stood the man, his eyes glowing with that same eerie light. His grin was wider now, his teeth sharp and jagged. You're one of us now, he whispered, his voice echoing in the stillness. I tried to turn away, but my body wouldn't obey. I was frozen, trapped in the reflection, unable to escape. The man's laughter filled the room, and the mirror began to crack, spider webbing outwards until it shattered into a thousand pieces. In the fragments of the mirror, I saw countless faces, all trapped like me, their eyes wide with fear. The man stepped forward, his form shifting and blurring, and I realized with a dawning horror that I would never leave this place. I was doomed to join the others, lost forever in the darkness. And then, just as the last piece of the mirror fell away, I woke up. I was back in my car, the road stretching out before me. The fog had lifted, and the first light of dawn was breaking over the horizon. I took a deep breath trying to shake off the lingering terror and continued driving. But as I glanced in the rearview mirror, my heart skipped a beat. For a split second, I thought I saw his hollow eyes staring back at me. And I knew, deep down, that the nightmare was far from over. Boo. Hello, sweet souls. Thank you for watching this video in full. It is greatly appreciated. Once again, all this is because of you, and I'm grateful for all the support that you have provided. Please make sure to check out my community tab as I do post a few times during the week. So let me know in the comment how you enjoyed the story in the format of a poem. Speaking of poem, let's keep the tradition going. In the attic's gloom, a presence thrives, unseen, his shadowed form cloaked in silent sheen. With whispers soft as silk, he haunts the night, a specter born of sorrow, shrouded tight. Beneath the eaves, where moonlight fears to tread, the darkness lingers, its hunger never fed. The end. Have a good night's sleep, everyone. If I wear you, I would verify one more time that the house is secure. See you in the next stories, I hope.